Thank you so much for coming to everyone that chose to learn about the next generation. So sometimes being called the next generation, the part of being in the next generation, it feels like you've inherited this burning house and then you get told it's your fault that you can't handle the heat. It's the next generation that will benefit the most from what happens in this conference, in this Earth Optimism Summit. If we succeed in our goals and we all unite and we really make change after this conference is over, then it's the next generation who will be the ones that benefit the most. And if we fail, it's the next generation that will be the ones that have to pay the price. But being part of the next generation, simply the name of it suggests that mm -hmm. they are the generation that is not this generation. The next generation are the leaders of tomorrow. And so often it feels like because they are framed as the leaders of tomorrow, we dismiss the next generation as leaders of today. But so many of you here are, I can see, what would be called the next generation. And so many of you have amazing stories of success and innovation. And I'm very, very excited to share these five stories here today. We should also point out that there's some youth journalists that have come all the way down from New York and that will be covering um, and tweeting and Instagramming on behalf of the New York Hall of Science. So there's a lot of youth focus in the next generation. I'm glad to see everyone together. So let me introduce our first speaker. It's Justin Schaefer, and he is the host of the YouTube channel Fascinate. Take it away, Justin. Hey, everybody. All right, so this is not going to be a very conventional presentation. I'm going to require you all's energy and input and excitement and enthusiasm. So if you guys think that something is exciting, then feel free to cheer, feel free to chant. If you think something's funny, laugh. If it's not, crickets. OK, great. So I'm going to be talking to you all about how to speak Gen Z. And you guys might be wondering at this point, well, what, whoops, what is Generation Z? Generation Z is a cohort that was born between about the year 2000 and about 2015, and they're the generation after millennials. The best way to describe this generation is true digital natives. This is the generation that was born in a time after analog. They have no memory of cassette tapes or CD Walkmans or VHS. You guys remember that though, right? You guys in the crowd do? Okay, cool. <laughs> Woo! Okay. So they're also the generation that is notorious for always being on those smartphones. But there is a fallacy that can occur when you stereotype an entire generation. You sometimes fail to account for the actual age of the members of that generation. So for example, when people stereotype millennials as being dismissive to authority or being entitled, then we're not thinking about the fact that maybe 20 years ago, when some people didn't have those positions of authority, then they were also dismissive to authority, and they also were more entitled than previous generations probably would have liked. So we have to be thinking about that before we judge generations. So at this point, you guys may be wondering, well, why am I even qualified to talk about Generation Z in the first place? So I'm dating myself. I was born in 1994. That makes me 22 years old. And that means I still know something. I know that sometimes people think if you have a certain age that you don't know anything. But I promise you guys, I know at least two things, and this presentation is one of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have the privilege of being able to serve Generation Z in a mentorship capacity. So uh, like I said, this generation was born in about the year 2000. So in order to understand how this generation behaves, how they think, and what their desires may be, we need to understand how they educate themselves. So I have a question for you all. What educational institution has the highest enrollment on the planet? Any guesses? YouTube. Interesting guess. Any other guesses? OK, well, if you Googled it, you would find Indira Gandhi National Open University in India. It's a massive institution with an enrollment of over 4 million students. Crazy. They're doing some bleeding edge stuff. But I'd argue, and you spoiled it, <laughs> that there is a bigger institution out there, <laughs> a bigger educational institution out there. With over 1 billion users, YouTube might be the biggest educational institution on the planet. How many of you all have ever learned how to do something on a YouTube video? Man, that's everybody. 
That's almost everybody. How many, ha- how many of you haven't learned how to do something on a YouTube video? Nobody. Nobody in the room. Wow, that's crazy. And that's also the story for Generation Z, as well as my friends. So we affectionately refer to YouTube as YouTube University. And so there's some crazy stories to really highlight that this is the way that Generation Z learns. True story. There was this kid who taught himself to drive on YouTube. It was in the news about two weeks ago. Have you guys heard of that story? Taught himself to drive, followed all the rules of the road, got no traffic infractions, and did all this while his parents were sleeping. This kid was eight years old. (laughs) Seriously, this kid was eight years old. This is how this generation learns. And that philosophy or that, that ideology has bled over into my generation as well. Because my generation and friends of mine are self-taught photographers, musicians, hairdressers, uh, makeup artists. They have made income from learning self-taught videos on YouTube. And that's also the case for Generation Z as well. According to this survey of about 5,000 Gen Zers, 72% of them want to start their own business. But entrepreneurship to Gen Z looks a lot different than entrepreneurship in other generations. For example, how many of you all have heard of Jen Selter? Raise your hand, please. Okay, one. That's okay, that's okay. (laughs) You are very cool, you are very cool. Jen Selter is an, what we call Instagram celebrity. She's also an entrepreneur in that way because she makes money from ad revenue. The feature that she is proud of, that she is notable for and, and features all over her page is her rear end. <laughs> and the, the, the crazy part about it is, one picture of her rear end is probably gonna have more reach than all of us at this conference for the next week. <laughs> so, I mean, when we think about, it's crazy, right? It's crazy, but when we think about it this way, when we have this message about climate awareness and science literacy that we're trying to teach to the next generation, which is largely scientific and informational in nature, how do we compete with something like this? Well, I have a few suggestions. One is high energy. You have to be so captivating, so attention grasping, so compelling that you get everybody's attention in the room, that you pull those Gen Zers away from their smartphones that they're always on. This is a photo from a career, a career day keynote that I gave a couple of weeks back, and I freestyle rap battled one of the high schools in front of all of his peers. <laughs> Question for you all. How many, how many of his peers do you think were glued to their smartphones when I was freestyle rap battling him in front of everybody? Zero. If you, as the disseminator of information, as the communicator, take personal responsibility for the, re- the release of the information and, and how much attention you grasp, then you'll be that much more successful in captivating the attention of Generation Z. But I know this approach isn't for everybody. I mean, not everyone likes to freestyle rap, and not everyone likes to come in a room and just yell at everybody until everyone looks, right? But there are some other ways to meet these Gen Zers halfway. So how do you show up on their phones? My suggestion, memes. <laughs> memes are arguably one of the most efficient ways to communicate in the modern world. Because what happens is, if you create a meme that has a concept that is hilarious or that is compelling in some way, then it has viral potential. These Gen Zers will see something like this, they'll laugh at it, and they'll share it with all their friends. And then you get your idea to become infectious, to spread out to places that you could never reach if you just talk to people in this kind of format. But well, moving forward, I'll show you guys how important memes are. This is a comparison. I know it might be hard for you guys in the back to see. This is a comparison of the amount of times memes was searched on Google versus the amount of times Jesus was searched on Google. And if you can, if you look here, in 2016, memes overtook Jesus. (laughs) On Google search, memes are more popular than Jesus. So that just goes to show how popular these things have become. But I'd be doing my science degree injustice if I didn't talk about the downside of rapid dissemination of information. This is a meme that was wildly popular during the presidential elections. Has anyone seen this meme before? Raise your hand if you have. Okay, a lot of you on the room have seen the meme. This is a quote by Donald Trump. It said, if I were to run, I'd run as a Republican. They're the dumbest group of voters in the country. They love anything on Fox News. I could lie and they'd still eat it up. I bet my numbers would be terrific. People Magazine, 1998. 
Well, there's a de debunking website called Snopes that looked at all the interviews in People magazine from 1998 on the magazine editions, audio interviews, and video interviews, and found no specific mention of this quote at all. This is made up. The entire thing is completely made up. And that goes to show that it's just as easy to communicate factual information and have it spread rapidly and be infectious as it is to communicate misinformation. So that goes to my final question that I'll leave you guys with. If you guys want to learn how to speak to Generation Z, you use facts that are efficiently tailored, that are exciting, and that are attention grabbing, and you use digital content. But how do you ensure that you separate yourselves from all the other stuff that's out there, all the misinformation? How do you condense your message and then communicate facts and truth so well that it stands out from the sea of misinformation that exists in the information age. Think about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justin. I hope you all got a lot of energy out of that. If you've just come into the room, my name's Jade Lovell. I'm the host of the YouTube channel PsyQ on the TYT network. We've got five panelists that will speak for 10 to 12 minutes each, and then we'll have a bit of Q&A. So if you've got your smartphones and you're thinking of a question, note it down, and we'll be able to answer them after this. It's a nice small room, so we'll be able to have a good group discussion. My next speaker is someone who is an incredible organizer has achieved so much, including the title of US National Organizer for 350.org, and has done so over such a long-ranging career and is just 24 years old. So let me introduce Deirdre Shelley. All right, 24 and a little short, so. Is this good? Can people hear me? Awesome. Um, so, hi everyone, happy Friday. My name is Deirdre. Um, I'm going to start my talk today with a little story from a few years ago. It was my spring semester of my junior year. I went to American University, just a couple miles away. Go Eagles, thank you. Um, and it was my first semester taking any classes about conservation or the environment or climate change and I was obsessed. I loved my classes, I loved the material, I loved my professors. Um, I was super nerding out that entire semester about my class, classes. Um, and I had one professor in particular who was really excited about greening our campus. Um, he was really excited about making our compost system more efficient and our recycling system more efficient. And he asked our class one day if someone would volunteer to run an event where students could come and brainstorm and talk about how we make our quaint little campus more green. And I was really into stuff, and I was like, that doesn't actually seem that exciting, but I want to impress you, so I'll volunteer. And I did, and we spent like two months trying to throw this event together, bring students in to talk about this, and we ended up having like no one there. We totally failed. And I felt bad and I was like, oh, maybe I actually shouldn't be doing this type of work or interested in these sorts of issues. I can't even get people to an event on campus. Um, but we chalked it up to bad luck, kept, like, moved on. Um, and over that summer, I continued getting involved in environmental work, more climate work. I was really motivated by climate change specifically. Um, and I volunteered to be a student recruiter for the People's Climate March in New York City. And yeah. And I said, yeah, I will make sure my campus and three other campuses in the DC area get on buses, get to New York for this big march. And I was so excited. It was going to be the largest climate march in history. Lots of periods um, in this meme. And I was just, it was amazing. And I, I felt like I was finally part of this thing that was like way bigger than me or my campus. And I was also really nervous because the last time I had tried to get people to something, I had utterly failed. And so we only had a few weeks between the start of the school year and the march. Um, but we, I remember the morning we put our bus ticket pages up on Facebook, up online. And I was like, oh, we'll see sales trickle in. This will be painful. Some of us had put money down on the, like the bus deposit. And we sold out two buses in like an afternoon. Um, 
every campus I was working with had similar experiences and we ended up selling out 10 buses to the People's Climate March. We had 500 students from DC get on buses and head up to New York. Um, and being in New York was an incredible and amazing experience. I hope some of you were there. Um, and we all came back to campus fired up, ready to go, um, and excited to take on even more work in this movement. But when I got back to campus, I, I, was, I was excited. Um, it was something I'll never forget. Um, but I was also really confused because here I had had an event on my campus. All I was asking people to do was to go to a classroom for an hour for extra credit and with snacks. I'm just, clearly, I'm over it. Um, <laughs> and no one came. And on the, you know, a few months later, I said, give me money, wake up at 6 AM, get on a bus, go to New York, give up your weekend, and do something you've never done before. And we couldn't, we ended up having people who couldn't even get a bus seat. Uh, so I talked to my professor about it, and I was like, it was just really bothering me because I knew I wanted to keep doing this work, but I was like, I have to figure this out. I, I can't keep being an organizer. And we talked for a long time, professors are chatty, and we ended up uh, just figuring out, at the end of the day, we needed to go big. And that my role, I think the role of a lot of us in this type of work, leaders in this work, our role is to give people big things to do. Give them big asks and a big vision and just go big. Um, because going big matches the scale of the crisis we face. Saying, I'm going to join the largest climate march in history feels like it matches one of the largest crises our generation faces. And it also, making big asks of people matches young people especially, young people's ambition and hunger and drive to make change in the world. Um, so like I said, my name is Deirdre. I work at 350. Um, and we are a group that is building a global climate movement. Uh, that's our tagline. And our mission is to inspire and train and mobilize people all over the world to take on climate-focused campaigns or projects or join mobilizations or actions about climate change in their community. Um, and this is our website, very clear what we're trying to do. Um, and we work, we are truly a global movement. Uh, we have co I have colleagues all over the world. We have people on our list in our volunteer and activist network all over the world. Um, and they're doing all sorts of things. Uh, some of my coworkers in Southeast Asia are trying to shut down really dangerous coal plants that contribute to climate change and also threaten uh, the livelihood of local communities living around those coal plants. I have coworkers in the Pacific Islands who are working to tell stories to the entire world about what it means to be on the front lines of the climate crisis and feel a lot of those impacts first. Um, I have colleagues in Western Europe and, and, and Europe in general who are working to get some of the biggest institutions in the world, like the Louvre and big foundations, to stop investing their money in fossil fuels. Um, so our work looks different everywhere. Um, I think if anyone in the room is an organizer, you know that every city, every town, every college campus has a different uh, style and way they do this work. Um, oh no, internet. Um, <laughs> but I'm just, so I'm going to focus a little bit just on the US and my work. Um, it can feel really general and the US organizer. I do a lot of types of things, but most of my work is focused on bringing more and more people, uh, again, into climate-focused campaigns and actions and projects, um, and mostly young people and students. We mm. have a huge student base, um, so we work a lot mostly with millennials. We're not quite in Generation Z yet, but a little bit. Um, and I really, I was reflecting on this panel and what I've seen in my work that's worked to get 500 students on a bus or get 2,500 people out to a rally. Um, and I came down to two big things that I wanted to share with, both, with you all. Um, and the first is the thing I said earlier, make a big ask. We find uh, not only is it right to make a big ask, like I said, climate change is a huge problem. We need to give people big things to do. Um, so it, it feels right, but it also just works better for us. We get more people to click on emails. We get more people to join a call or show up to a rally if we give them a big demand. Um, so we say, join the largest climate march in history. Be part of a global climate movement. 
stop one of the most dangerous oil pipelines in the world. That works. That, and we feel like that's our role. Um, we don't have as much success when we say things like, remember to turn off your light bulb or remember to recycle your soda can. We like to go big. Um, the other big takeaway I have, um, one more, uh, we trust people. When I signed up to be a student recruiter for the People's Climate March, no one hired me or really asked me that many questions. Uh, they just said, we want to have the biggest march about climate change ever, and we need a lot of people's help to make that happen. And for me, as just a student um, on a college campus, unconnected, pretty unconnected from anyone who was actually planning the march, that was really empowering. I could see, oh, I have a role to play in this movement. There's something I can do and offer to this huge, amazing, beautiful, big thing. And this is something we do all the time. Uh, we work a lot digitally, and we connect with people who we have their email, but we don't, we might not know them. They don't know anyone on our staff. Um, we did this in the fossil fuel divestment movement when we told students um, at hundreds of colleges, college campuses that they should run their campaign, run their own campaigns to get their university or college to stop investing in the fossil fuel industry. And thousands of students joined the movement. It spread to hundreds of campuses and hundreds of leaders stepped up and said, yes, I'll, I'll run this on my campus. Um, I'll take ownership and take a piece of this big pie that is fighting climate change. Uh, we do this in DC all the time. I don't know how many of you live here, but we have marches and rallies in the city every other day. This was the night before a big rally against the Dakota Access Pipeline. It was planned in a few hours. I really needed, we thought it was going to be pretty big. I really needed volunteers. We sent an email and like 40 young people showed up in 24 hours and said, yep, I'll volunteer, I'll be there, I can leave work early, tell me what you need. Um, and it worked and they did. I didn't know, I didn't really know many people in this room, but I had to say, yeah, we're trying to do a big thing and I'm gonna trust you and give you ownership and power and a role in this march we're trying to have tomorrow. Um, so those are the two biggest things I've learned just working with young people and trying to bring people into this movement for the long haul. Uh, we, and, and those things that I've learned are also the things that give me optimism and hope about fighting this big, scary, sad problem. Um, and we just, I see again and again, we're working on a march next week and it's, it's happening on my phone right now. I forgot to put it on silent. Um, but we see that when we give people a big, bold vision, a big, bold ask, and we tell them that we need them to take a chunk of it and we trust them to do that, that big things can happen. So that's it. Well, I've heard people accuse Gen Z of being unambitious before, but it's nice to see them doing these little tiny projects like ending climate change. Um, my next speak, have you guys ever, how many scientists do we have in the room? Put your hand up if you're a scientist. That's wonderful. How many of you have heard people um, defend their views on climate change by saying, I'm not a scientist? Have you heard that before? I have. Um, and I'll, so it's probably fitting that our next speaker is not a scientist, um, but he's also, as far as I'm aware, not a Republican. He's <laughs> the executive producer of Noah's, Noah's uh, Ocean Today project and probably does just as much as any scientist in advocating for science-based policy and protecting the planet. So let me introduce Kurt Mann. How many folks in the, in the room are educators and then scientists? Okay, so we have a group here that's interested in high quality information produced in a way that can get to people that need it. And I'm really inspired by these first two speakers because number one, they're really looking at the digital uh, communication stream. And today, if you're gonna get information out to young people, not only the next generation, but the next, next generation, which is the group that I work with, sort of teenagers, that is our, our target, target group. But then I'm looking at next generation to be teaching these uh, uh, young people all about science. So I'd like to start by letting you know that I have a really cool job. 
because I get to interact with the scientists. And the scientists have all this amazing information. When they first tell it to me, I can't quite understand what they're talking about. My job is to translate it for my brain, which is about 14 years, you know, uh, arrested development. And then it works for, for my audience. I get to meet people like Edie, who is a renowned uh, researcher and scientist on bioluminescence. These are the kind of images that we use to attract young minds to the ocean. The program is called Ocean Today. It's a Smithsonian NOAA program. It's a partnership. It's a collaboration. And it started uh, at the Natural History Museum downtown. This is an interactive kiosk. The reason they wanted an interactive kiosk is that they wanted to be able to get fresh information into the museums that, were, that, that would focus on research and science you know, year by year, day by day. And these touch screens give you access to that content. Now, just one year before that, the iPhone was released. So this was a time when an interactive screen was really new and, and really fresh. But the release of this iPhone has been really instrumental into, in the direction that Ocean Today and NOAA Media has, has, has gone. Because if you can't get your content into that digital stream and produce it in a way that, that folks consume it, you're not going to keep their attention. So we have a website uh, that, that looks at all the different categories, or the main categories, that NOAA focuses on. And I'm going to show you clips from this website in the next couple minutes. 230 videos. So if you're an educator, if you're a scientist, these videos are vetted by NOAA, reviewed by Smithsonian. They are short, two, two and a half minutes long, and they're high quality. You can go to the website, find the, the, the stories that you want to tell, embed it into your website or your presentation, download it if you need to, and use this content, because uh, as we heard, it's hard to find content that you know is vetted and know is, is, is accurate, and this content is. You know, I hope you don't get Here's offended a clip. by this, but I am delighted that I've given you a puzzle. Yeah, well, this is why it's exploration. You know, we live for this stuff. We live for the new and the puzzling. Now, this is a program where they record video live in the deep ocean. You can actually go online and watch them and listen to this narration as the scientists are discovering the ocean floor. I encourage you to, uh, to uh, search these videos out on the Ocean Today website. They're incredible. So these are the kind of stories that we tell. Ocean farmers. I've got a, a, a five-part series called 3D Ocean Farming on the next wave of uh, folks that are focusing on aquaculture. This gentleman has a farm where he's growing kelp so that he can pull carbon out of the air and, and provide new sources of food. The ocean is an incredible resource that, uh, that we really haven't utilized. Research. Um, NOAA has a huge fleet of ships that actually go out and research the ocean. Uh, we've got a story that we're working on right now where they are putting uh, listening devices all throughout the Gulf of Mexico near the, uh, the horizon spill. And they are, they are gathering data on uh, where the mammals are using this technology and, and close to discovering whether or not the mammals left that area and whether or not they, they returned. And of course, ocean animals. I mean, I love NASA, and there's amazing things out in space. But when you go down deep into the ocean, you can find creatures that look like aliens. And then there's the fun stuff that are right here on our shores. Uh, we're going to be rolling out a whole series this month. We've got a new program called Ocean Today Every Full Moon on horseshoe crabs. They might look super creepy, but there's a lot more to a horseshoe crab than meets the eye. First off, they're not even crabs. They're actually closer cousins to spiders or scorpions. So, so what we try to do in this content is to really make it fun, capture people's attention, give them the information they need. Sometimes it's very sobering science. And then wrap it up with what you can do. This is one of the reasons I love uh, 360.org, 
is that they have fun with their content, they have fun with their message, and they give folks something to do. If you do happen to be caught in a rip current, stay calm. It won't pull you under. It'll just pull you away from shore. Now this clip actually lasts for seven seconds longer. Uh, but what we've been experimenting with is 15 second clips with messaging. We call it Ocean Chum. Putting it into the Facebook feed, <laughs> right? You get it out there, you, 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 you chum your audience, and then you bring them into the longer content that might be two and a half, three minutes long. We had a, 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 a video last year called The Rip Current Survival Guide. It uh, reached 17 million viewers on Facebook because people care about safety. And if you have a safe time at the ocean, then you're more likely to go there more often and more likely to get into conservation. The sanctuary system is a really important um, uh, asset. How many are familiar with the sanctuary system? OK. Um, these are areas that are uh, specially protected. They're like national parks in the ocean. And these kind of uh, conservation efforts are going a long way in terms of helping certain parts of the ocean regenerate itself. And of course, the amazing phenomena that's underwater. Orange and red flashes in the pitch black. Lava oozes from the cracks and rolls across the ocean floor. Earthquakes rumble and roar as tectonic plates grate against each other. Now, of course, if we don't produce this content and get it out to schools, people don't really know how amazing and incredible the Earth actually is. And once you start learning about all the amazing life out there and how incredible this, this planet is, you're more likely to then protect it. So the new, new program that we've got called Ocean Today, Every Full Moon. One thing we realized is that when we were throwing videos out, people didn't really know when they were available. So now we've got a program, Every Full Moon, we produce a collection of videos, five or six videos over a, around a single topic, and publish it on the full moon. We've got seven collections, Animals of the Ice, all about uh, uh, ice melt and how it's impacting animals. Endangered Ocean, the work that people are doing to save species. Trash Talk, all about marine debris. And we did one on bioluminescence. So that's an example of one of the video chumps that we throw out. And you'll love this one. Nah, that yeah, always works. So I'm a big believer in awe and wonder. You have to provide the awe. You have to provide the wonder. And part of my story is that uh, I've realized that doom and gloom just isn't working. And I want to talk about that as I wrap up my talk. This uh, collection is really important. It came out just this last month. It's called Coral Comeback? Mark. We've had terrible bleaching events really over the last 30 years, but especially over the last three years, 50% of our, our corals are dead. So um, I'm going to leave you with this last clip. And this is an example of how you can give people the information, but don't leave them on the doom and gloom story. Leave them with something that they can aspire to, something that they can believe in. And that's really what Ocean Today uh, is all about. Uh, we're a federal agency. We can't advocate for particular uh, policies but we can help give people tools and the information they need to make their world better. So I'm gonna leave you with this clip. In this series, we will look at all the great benefits corals have to people. Actually, that's not Garbage. what I wanna show you. People might say. I'm getting the wrap up sign. Okay. Uh, here it is. Beyond the doom and gloom. Through the last 
two bleaching events in Hawaii, we were able to go out and mark hundreds of coral colonies on the reef that didn't bleach. These are the strongest players. These are our super athletes of the reef. We bring them into the lab. We train them in our environmental treadmills. We make sure they have the best nutrition and they have offspring that are super corals. And they're super corals because they can potentially face the future that will be warmer and more acidic and survive it. So I want to thank you for your time. I really believe that if we look at the science and we share the information and we get together and work hard and know that we can create the next human adventure, um, we can do it. So thanks for your time. So my next speaker has been working on a little project. She's been um, putting together an event that you might have heard of. It's called the Earth Optimism Summit. Um, and so she's been quite busy recently. But when she's not putting together awesome conferences like this one, she is the digital producer of the Smithsonian's Natural History Museum. This is Lauren Ward. Hey everyone, can you hear me all right? All right. So, how many of you have ever been tasked with writing a report for school and your teacher says, you know, you have to get credible sources because Wikipedia is just not going to cut it. And so, you say, okay, well, I'm going to check Wikipedia first and I'm just going to get all my credible sources from there and then I just won't reference that I used Wikipedia. So, we, <laughs> nobody, no one else, no? Okay. Um, so we at the Ocean Portal try and be that very accessible Wikipedia source. So our, our main game here, you know, we've got, we've had presenters that have talked about using memes, getting attention, being high energy. We exist because people need to get their information somewhere to write those reports, and we are the reliable source for that. So we provide the information and we make it very easy to find. Um, you know, by providing full and accurate information from a trusted smart source, which is the Smithsonian, uh, and that is reviewed by subject matter, our pages end up surfacing extremely high on uh, YouTube, or not YouTube, Google searches. Um, so as Justin and several of our presenters have mentioned before, this is an opportunity for us to really combat fake news. Um, by having a credible source that's been reviewed, peer-reviewed by several scientists. D who knows around here um, that Smithsonian actually has a scientific, an active scientific presence, that people are practicing science. That's great! That makes me so happy. We're more than just a museum. We have act active scientists who are taking this information, uh, taking a look at it, making sure that it's all um, factual and accurate. So if they Google it uh, and we have content, they come. So this graph kind of shows how quickly some of our pages rise. Um, these overview pages that I mentioned are extremely popular. Uh, ocean acidification page, our ocean acidification page was published in 2014 um, and started off as number 14 on Google search. Um, but uh, now it's number four rising to the first page, which is very exciting. And what's more, our page detailing the ecological effects of the um, Deepwater Horizon oil, oil spill uh, is often listed as the first piece of content on Google as well. So it is the definitive resource for understanding um, what happened and getting the exact science behind it in a way that's digestible. You know, another uh, part of this is not to dumb it down. And this is something that I like to do a lot is um, connect the science to popular culture. So The Shallows, which maybe y'all heard of, came out in 2015, it was a, 2016 rather, was a summer blockbuster. Um, it was a simple movie with uh, <laughs> a predictable ending, but it, it gave us the opportunity to explore a complicated perception of sharks and why we feel that way about them and what about their biology has led us to, to reach that place. And so we published this article it had the trailer, you know, it had Blake's Lively, 
Um, and we really took a, a look at the shark science that was, well, shark science that was presented in the film, took a hard look at it, compared it with our own shark science from our uh, scientists at the Smithsonian, and we're able to have a very complicated discussion about about why we why we're scared of sharks, what their true feeding habits are, and you know whether or not this should mean that we're we should be worried when we go to the beach in the summertime, right? So this was a really good opportunity to express really complicated science in a way that was accessible to people. A lot of people had seen this film; it did very well in our um, in in uh, Google, so it was a it was a good success. So we also try and keep it interesting, aside from being this educational source for people to go to because they have to for you know, uh, research assignments for school, uh, we're doing is exactly what our panelists have, have uh, communicated. We're making text on screen videos, which are great for social media, and also interactive graphics. Ooh, that got covered up a little bit, but you know what that says. Um, all as an attempt to package information in ways that um, are accessible to people who might have a shorter attention span. It's okay. Um, and we bring it on a silver platter. So, you know, I mentioned a lot about Google. Just Googling something, hopefully it rises up to the top and people see it. That's that's one way to do it. And we do a pretty good job of that, especially with our, with our overview pages. But uh, ultimately, there are two things we know for sure. Um, students need to write research papers at some point, so they're gonna Google this information. And they're also likely using social media. Um, we try not to make our content hard to find, uh, you know, especially on Facebook, Tumblr, and Twitter. Um, and so, again, bringing that pop culture in, we did a, a Poke, you, know, you guys remember Pokemon Go? It's kind of gone out of fat a little bit, but you know. So we, we did an actual comparative analysis of the Pokemon that exist in Pokemon Go and in the Pokemon universe and the animals that they are actually based off of. And we found some fascinating results. Um, so one of them being the uh, Nudibrink and uh, Shellos is its counterpart and um, you know, same with the Amenonite. Uh, there were 12 uh, Pokemon in all that were all water Pokemon because we obviously would have been part of the Cerulean Gym at Ocean Partle. Um, and we put this on Tumblr, and it did quite well, too, you know, because it was just another way to access uh, uh, new information, complicated ideas through this, this fun opportunity that was both very timely and um, very nostalgic for a lot of people, too. Uh, we also did this with, um, this was another fun article that we did, and this was, this was an analysis of all the car, well, five of our favorite cars that were all inspired by fish. And this is the, um, this is the Stingray, which I, I assume if you've ever seen Bullet with Steve McQueen, you know about, but um, rather that was the Mustang. I'm sorry for anyone who, who actually knows that film. But the Stingray, um, the box fish, which actually ended up being a Mercedes-Benz, it kind of looks like the element, a square car that did terribly in the market. And um, the Manta Ray, if you guys know about that car, and the, um, the, oh, now I'm forgetting the last one. Emily, do you remember the last one? Okay, that's Emily, <laughs> Emily Frost in the corner there. She also works on the Ocean Portal. Um, so this also did very well because it was another way to package information in a new way that maybe you know, car lovers could enjoy and also learn about some endangered species of fish. So ultimately, we're, we're Nancy Knowlton, uh, who runs the Ocean Portal and is also the convener of this meeting, her big message is to inspire. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to give good news because ultimately, the doom and gloom, as we've noticed, can only go so far, and it makes you feel very small, and it makes you feel like you can do nothing. And so that's how the Earth Optimism and Ocean Optimism hashtags actually began. It began with Ocean Optimism, and then evolved into Earth Optimism. Um, but we also really try and foster uh, uh, it, mentorship relationships with folks who use the Ocean Portal so that they, we can sort of craft what their career paths may look like. Inspiring, you know, Gen Z or even millennials to be interested in the ocean is a really big uh, priority of the Ocean Portal to sort of have the, tor the torch passed to the next generation. And of course, we do uh, invest a lot of time into communicating with teens. Uh, we have a fantastic event happening at the Natural History Museum um, 
tomorrow, uh, a teen only, Sunday, a teen-only event. Uh, we're shutting down Curious, which is our teen space for just teens to come and basically um, absorb all the amazing uh, science, conservation science that will be here at the summit. We'll have many uh, scientists also going over there on Sunday. So um, with that, uh, I'll just end with a video that we created for Ocean Optimism to inspire everybody in this room. Thanks so much for your time, everybody. So before we get to our final speaker before the q and I want to play a game with everyone. So can I get every person in this room to stand up? And if you're stuck sitting at the back or can't fit in the room, there, you can come and sit right up the front so we can be in part of the conversation. All right. Sit down if you think that you are a member of the next generation. Okay. <laughs> there was a lot of confused faces being like, oh, my God. Sit down if you're under 20. Couple. Sit down if you're under 30. Sit down if you're under 40. <laughs> Sit down if you're under 128. <laughs> so my next speaker works at an organization that is 128 years old, and her job is to make it relevant and engaging for the next generation. Um, she is the executive vice president and chief program and impact officer for the National Nat Geo Society. So let me introduce Brooke Renette. This is good. Hi, guys. Wow, there's a lot of people here. And there's a lot to talk about. I, I am sort of inspired by all the people who were on the panel before to just kind of especially because of Lauren's thing with some shark stuff, to just sort of step back for a few years in my career. Um, just prior to this job, I actually ran National Geographic Studios. So I ran the film and the digital and the television for National Geographic for a few years. And before that, I worked at Discovery. And when I first showed up at Discovery, they gave me this assignment. They said, there's this, there's this long running series. You have to do it this way. It's gonna be this thing where it's great, people love it, it's kind of dropping off a little bit, but we want you to handle this and do it the way that it's always been done or else. That was Shark Week. They handed it to me and they said, you gotta do it so that people are killed all the time by sharks. People are murdered, sharks just float around looking for people to bite and eat. And I said, well, is it, are the scientists actually saying that too? And of course, we know the answer to that. So, so the interesting thing, and this was just a way to think about things, because the truth is, and I think we're thinking about that a lot right now, is that fear is a really powerful vector of information into people's brains. That's why it bleeds, it leads on the local news, because I used to be a news person before I was that. That's why we put stuff like that on the news, because they want to get ratings. You get ratings when you tell people that there's something that's gonna kill them. We have to fight that, that's what we're here for. And the truth is, is that there is another vector that, oh yeah, there I am. <laughs> anyway, there's another great vector 
that we were talking about before too, which is wonder and awe. And let me say a swear word, holy shit. Holy shit is an excellent vector into the human brain. So going back to Shark Week, one of the things that we, one of the things that I did is basically said, well, first of all, sharks are awesome. Second of all, it happened to be the time when a phantom camera, which as you guys know is a thousand frames per second, just got, we just built a, uh, an underwater housing. So we could actually shoot sharks in slow motion. This is none of those pictures here. I wish I had it for you, but I don't because I don't work there anymore. But, but shoot sharks in a uh, thousand frames per second and actually see them as individuals, which had never been done before. You pretty much only saw a great white shark if he was on an autopsy table. Otherwise, you couldn't get close enough. You couldn't get, you couldn't shoot it well enough. But putting these things together, we said, we shot these sharks and you could see they were individuals. They were looking back at you. They had scarring on them that clearly that's another white who's just bitten them. And clearly that is where a, a seal kind of whacked this one. And they were able to put together all these fantastic longitudinal studies, like one at the Farallons, where they'd been actually studying the same sharks for 25 plus years. And they knew that one's Tom Johnson and that one's Scar Girl and that one's whatever. So we put all this stuff together and then made it happy. So happy Shark Week is what I did with my marketing team. Happy Shark Week with all the scientists and saying, look at these unbelievably great creatures. They're so awesome. They jump out of the water and now we can really see it. They do all these things that they do and they are individuals who have their lives and don't you love them? So what was great about that is we were able to connect people to this. And then people sort of said they wanted to get the Scar Girls tattooed on their arm and they wanted to do all sorts of things. But the other thing we need to think about is with all this stuff, awareness is not enough. What do you get people to do when you got a bunch of people? What do you get them to do when you have their holy shit and you have their brain and you have captured them and they say, now what? So there's a lot of things you can do with people. We said, okay, don't eat shark fin soup. And everybody who wasn't Asian was like, check, no problem. You know, that's, and then we said, okay, if you are Asian, you have an Asian grandmother, and she really, really wants you to have that for your wedding soup, here's a little script of what to say to her. Grandmother, I love you so much. Thank you so much for actually, you know, wanting to give my wedding health and happiness for me and everything. But here's a way that I just want to show you something and talk to you. So anyway, we made a bunch of things that were just kind of, Here's little things we can do. We did partnerships with a bunch of people. And actually, I'm not saying that we did this, but everything helps. Shark finning is going down. It is going down. So everything can help. It can be something that's actually just fun. And people sit around and just eat Cheetos and watch Shark Week, and they don't even know they're helping, but they're kind of helping because they're waving the flag. Or people down in Chatham who are standing there and saying, the whites are back, hooray! You know, we can't go swimming today, but here they are. Anyway, so a couple things are important. I think we're all talking about scale and getting to all of the little kids who have phones. And I have a 12-year-old daughter, so I have a Gen Z in my house. I just am not one. Um, but seeing how they're just all on the phones all the time. But the interesting thing is, it's still true, and this is true for all media. I come from old media where we sliced and diced every single thing, but it's still kind of the same stuff. What gets people's brains? We're still talking about brains and how do you get into them and how do you change them? And that is still emotion, it's story, it's pictures. It's a lot of things that National Geographic has really done well for a long time. Beautiful, beautiful picture that cuts right into your chest and makes you open to thinking something different. Same thing with a great film, same thing with a great story, same thing with a really fantastic tale of somebody who explored something and found something new that no one has ever found before. Stories are fantastic. Also, how can I use this? Utility is important on all these things. So this video I'll show you is an explorer who was working with Blue Tangs, and she's a young explorer who works with us. Um, one of the 500 grantees we give every year, and we give a ton of grants to young people, and she's one of them that is our Young Explorer grantee. And when Finding Dory came out, she's like, you know, I've been working with these animals, and let's do something with this. Hang on, how do I take this? Um, Uh-oh. How is it just going to play? Thank you. 
So this was just an easy little thing. It just went out, but it was one of the most shared things of anything because it was actually useful. It was useful to people who thought about it and they could share it with somebody else who might be thinking about something. And I think that that's really important because awareness alone is nice, but it's not enough. Emotion needs to be attached, utility needs to be attached. Um, and people really want something to do. I mean, I think that, again, this is all Shannon's work and seeing it. And I, I think of all the little kids who have just seen Finding Dory and Finding Me. but really it's very you know it's very useful another thing that I want to talk about quickly um, is uh, is it does work to do things I'm going to show a little clip of something that has um, a, a we have a guest star in the corner Enrique. and they are waiting for the eyes to, to <laughs> this open is a up clip from Malia to swim in so they can the catch the flood Look, there he I is. can't Sorry. believe <laughs> what they sound like it's amazing they're like purring You know, I, I don't want to be in a planet without these animals. Now, this one was, this one was uh, retweeted a bunch of times and everything, but the Before the Flood film was, again, that wasn't call to action, it was share it. And actually, that thing was downloaded and watched more than 80 million times. I think it's something like 90 million times now. The whole movie was. This was a clip to kind of... But again, people thinking, okay, now what? What do I do? So I think that thinking about how do we do this? How do we, the next step is, and this looks weird, but the next step is to me is to think about how do we get, how do we use video and use all these shareable things to get people in real life? Because actually in real life is a really critical component of this ecosystem that I don't think we talk about enough. How are we getting people to do something get together with other people, maybe watch more videos, but that, ha that that's somehow a driver to what we want them to do. And these things are just things, crazy things that we, do, we threw together, not even knowing if it was gonna work at National Geographic, just said come over for drinks and talk to an explorer or something. People are mobbing the place. We have National Geographic Lives that we do all over the place, and we uh, all over the country. And then we also have education. We do have a uh, 50 states of education work. But whenever we send an explorer, even on a bless you, even on a even on a live chat or something, a live Google chat, or whenever we can send an explorer to schools and everything, fantastic because they can actually meet each other and people can talk to each other about how do they do stuff. And it just you know, what we're talking about is the human brain and the fact that all of us in this room are still animals and there's a way that we actually do respond to things and there's a way we not so much respond to things. And one of the ways that we really, really respond is to actual people who are actually talking to us. And that's a big thing we should think about. Um, anyway, uh, so this is a couple of other things we do. We do photo camps that are like sending kids out to actually start taking pictures and see the world through, you know, taking, you know, obviously photography and everything. But there's not just the picture that's the output there. It's the kid whose brain is actually being activated by looking at other people and thinking about this. So anyway, my final one is a little, oh no, did you put that one? Anyway, it's a little tiny thing of, uh, It's a little video of another thing that we do. We put a hundred... I saw a snake, a tailor, and a newt. Oh, really? <laughs> I left the newt crawl on my hands. This is a bio blitz when we said... When the newt went on my arm, yeah. it tickled. Parks. It was so oh, yeah. tickled. That's yeah, all I could say. Blind. I fell in the mud, too. It, it was really gross. There were spiders and everything. While I first didn't like it, I loved it a lot. So it was very liberating going through the mud. My butt is stuck! Okay, you ready? Just took a stick from the floor and kept on walking with it. Imani was very fearful of um, anything that flew or crawled. 
but now I'm not scared anymore. Anyway, this is a BioBlitz. Last year, 100,000 people joined us in BioBlitzes, which is something we do with a lot of other people too. But again, what we're all trying to do is get people, little kids, bigger kids, all kids, everybody, out into the world to love it so that we can take care of it. So anyway, that's what I got to say. Thanks. <laughs> So we have 15 minutes for Q&A, and while I ask my um, speakers to come and have a seat up here, it wouldn't be a session on the next generation unless we took a selfie. So can I get everyone to put their hands in the air? Hands up, hands in the air. Yeah, get in there. Awesome. And we'll tag it with Earth Optimism so you can all see yourselves. Yes, if anyone is here and they've got their smartphones, please use the hashtag Earth Optimism and spread the word of this awesome event and, uh, and the mission behind it. So I want to um, first ask a couple of questions. So we only have 15 minutes. So if we want to also ask some questions from the audience, we need to do speed round. So my first question to our panelists is, in one sentence, who are the next generation? I don't know. I really think it's all of us because... Um, you know, I've got the 14-year-old Arrested Development, so I'm part of the next generation. My son, who is who's 12 and in the audience, he's the next generation. So I think. What's your son's name? His name is Kai, and he wants to be an uh, animal rescuer. Woo! The next generation isn't people; they're robots. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I kind of would have to agree with your sentiments. I just wanted to add something on that wasn't that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, gosh, I hope this isn't a cop out, but I, I agree, and I agree because if we if we constantly say, "Oh, the next generation will take care of it," it sort of it removes the responsibility from ourselves, no matter what age you are. So, can I say that as all of us? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, same. All of us. I think young people play a special role, um, no matter what year it is or time of the world it is. But everyone has a responsibility um, in this work. Um, yes, I would say the same thing, although I would say I would slightly split it into, or not split it, the next generation are the ones that are going to actually step up and say, we're enthusiastic, we're curious, we want to do it, and we are optimistic and hopeful about the whole thing. Now, that can be any age, it can be anybody, but that's who's going to be that next generation that we need to work with. Good answers, yeah. So part of my job is I run a science PR company called Reagency. And often my clients come to me and they say, look, we just want to do something millennial. Um, we want to engage the youth. Uh, how can we engage the millennials in this project? And I often say to them, well, why weren't they already engaged in your project? Do you mean to tell me that you did a whole project and there wasn't any young people involved? What are you doing? So... <laughs> So given that sometimes we, um, we neglect to ask the opinion or get the input of the young generation, what would you say are their wants and their needs? You can go in any order. Brooke's going to go first. I'm trying to think of my 12-year-old who I was going to try and have bring her to. Um, like anybody, they just want to... Actually, they want to hear tales of daring and heroism. They want to feel like we're engaged in a great heroic project that they're part of, that they're not excluded, they're actually on the front lines. And I think we should all feel that way. Yeah, I think young people want the same thing as anyone, which is to just have a prosperous, happy life in a world that's stable and a climate that's safe. And I think, yeah, they need to be asked to act um, in big ways that feel feel like they match up with what we're facing. Okay, I go back on what I said before. So the young, okay, the next generation, I think that maybe one thing that does separate them as maybe generally as a whole is that they do have a lot of energy and they're not as jaded as some of us are. And they, they, they want to experience the world in an optimistic lens because if they didn't at the age of 14 thinking that oh we're done you know th there's there's nothing i can do to help this place is such a horrible place to be in so that that youthful energy um, to to want to be optimistic and to uh, refuse the doom and gloom i think um, is is what people are are kind of searching for 
Uh, and then to add to that, I think that the next generation has this extreme desire to find a niche and follow their passion. I mean, it's kind of a cliche at this point that we use, but uh, like I was saying before, with this next generation that such a large percentage of them want to become entrepreneurial and not in the traditional way, but rather in finding what they love to do and doing that over and over again, perfecting that and then making money off of it. So if you can think about a way to tie your big picture concept or your big picture idea into that, then I think that you will be well on your way to influencing the Gen Z. I remember when I was bringing up the DiCaprio film to show my son, we were doing Wednesday films and, and about 10 minutes in, he was like, I'm getting all stressed out, you know, like, and a lot of times uh, when, 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 it, when we're bringing something up, something like that up, it does stress out young kids. And so I had someone in an interview once over in uh, Scotland say, uh, if it's not fun, it's not sustainable. And then as an interviewer, I was like, I'm always trying to look behind someone. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. A little new agey for me. But <laughs> then I tested it, and I tested it, and I tested it. And, I, and then I was like, you know what? You're right. So I think we need to really articulate what is the next great human adventure? What is our adventure? Where are we going? What is going to be so much fun to do? What is the challenge? You know, what can we create next as a, as a whole species? Uh, you know, can we self-regulate the planet? Can we make it like our body? I mean, you know, that's what we need to do. Can we get out of our individual uh, worlds and wants uh, and, and then do it and then have great fun, you know, making it happen? People often accuse the next generation of not being engaged. But if you've ever seen a young person, they're the most engaged of anyone. They're not just staring at their phone doing nothing. They're engaging when their heads are down and they're looking at that smartphone. But they're often not engaged with what you're doing or what we're doing. So given that, how would you say that young people engage? How do young people speak? Well, as a young person, I speak... <laughs> <laughs> I speak, uh, and I mean, I, I've noticed that you know my friends and even the younger generation speaks through sharing content that speaks for them. If you can, like I was saying before, make a meme or a humorous short video like you guys were talking about that speaks for a person m better than they could probably articulate it immediately, then they'll share that with their friends. Uh, we have like, uh, there's this app called GroupMe where I guess somebody will like have a reaction to something and rather than express their emotional reaction, even using emojis, what they'll do is they'll use like a GIF image and they'll GIF an image from some popular movie or something and that'll convey their emotion even better and oftentimes more humorously. So it's a little bit different. We, we just do things a little bit differently and the more conscious you are of that, the better you can craft your content or your message. How do you speak to your uh, Oh man. I would say that young people also communicate quickly and rapidly um, and are always, it's things just move really quickly on GroupMe or Slack or text or Snapchat or anything. Um, and I think one thing like I love is, is Facebook Live and live streaming and I think uh, we do that a lot for our events and I think that's um, live streaming and, and having people feel like they're right there. Um, and then once something's happened, it, it happened online, it's over, um, is an important element to how we bring people into different types of work and, and tell different stories. Do we have any questions from the audience? We have one here. Yes. So um, we started developing a, a, a choral series, and it was initially called Choral Comeback. And I had someone come up to me midway through the process, and they said, you know, maybe we should put a question mark at the end of that. And I thought, yes, we need to put a question mark at the end of it. So for me, it was deliver the sobering science. I don't know if it was a, a B, or C. Deliver the sobering science. This is the information that you're dealing with. 50% of the corals are dead. And then give people an opportunity to, you know, to mourn over that. Uh, there were scientists uh, at NOAA that were just were crying when this data was coming in. 
and it chokes me up just even th you know thinking about it. But then Ruth Gates, who you saw on the on the on the tape there, she said, "But fifty percent are there." So you have your experience. Focus on the fifty percent, and then what are scientists, conservationists, and people doing that are working to make that fifty percent back to a a hundred percent? But it has to happen fast, and it has to happen now, and you can't be frozen with that. So I think there's a, you know, the brain science is what I try to follow, and how can you work with the brain science and be real about it instead of, you know, when I do talk about ocean optimism, sometimes it's hard because I'm like, you have to kind of give the whole picture. You can't just give, you know, one, one slice. But nature is resilient, and it can come back quickly. But it's the humans that are the, the brain of the planet, they're the ones that can can make make it happen. Yeah, and I'd like to echo a lot of those sentiments. I didn't really talk about it, but I do a YouTube series called Fascinate. It's a science communication series with two to three minutes short videos. Please subscribe. <laughs> well, yeah, if you type in Fascinate on YouTube, it's the first thing that comes up, uh, shameless plug. But um, what I like to do is also uh, I, I go through the research papers and I find the hard science and I communicate that through a skit or some kind of exciting way. But I, you know, a lot of times, yes, that is like objective communication of a problem. But what I try to complement that it, with is a solution of some sort. And preferably, especially because I know I'm on the internet and people are looking for quick, fast, and in a hurry stuff, I shoot for solutions, things that they can do right now. You know, here's what you can do right now to work towards this problem, or if it's even like a health issue that you could be facing that you don't know about, here's some foods that you should stay away from to avoid that health issue. Uh, and yeah, I, I try to, at least in my field, uh, I try to get prescriptive uh, when I, you know, I supplement that science uh, with prescription of some sort that I've researched as well. I'll follow up on that. I think this is a really, really important question. I'm really glad you brought it up. I think. Earth optimism especially can um, convey a sense of maybe even tone being tone deaf. Like, what do you mean? Or why are you optimistic? There's a lot to not be optimistic about right now, and that is certainly the case. I think what's more important here is to, to convey the sentiment of when you have a, an issue, a conservation issue, and, and you apply science to it, and you apply good factual science to it, that is something that you have to be optimistic about. You apply science to it and you get results. And if we continue um, t you know, critically looking at these issues and, and, and uh, putting our best people, our best science towards it, there is a serious reason to be optimistic. And there, there is a turnaround that can happen. The alternative, true, I mean, if you, if you don't believe in, in uh, ocean optimism, well, I, the alternative, I guess, is to be pessimistic. And who wants to, I mean, what a way to live, you know? Who wants to do that? Uh, you, you gotta be excited about something. So uh, I, I think there's, there's true, there's real reason to be optimistic, and if you're any other way, you're making yourself sick, so. Did you guys wanna tackle it? Brooke? Yeah, this is something we think about all the time. Every, you know, emails we write, Facebook posts, and we don't lie to people and say, you know, we don't do option A or option B. Um, and I think what we, the thing we say again and again and again is the thing that gives us hope and, and can give others hope is joining this movement, making this work part of your life, finding community and others who are making that same commitment and, and doing the same type of work. And I've, you know, even for me on the, the days where I read scientific articles and I'm depressed and sad, I, I find so much hope and resilience in the community of people who are committed to, to tackling this problem. Yeah, I'm, I, I guess I come back to the single most powerful thing we know of in the known universe kind of is the human brain. And it seems like the only thing that can save us is really a paradigm shift in how do people really think differently about how to tackle all this. If we don't think differently and we don't act, we kind of know, I mean, science tells us exactly how this is going to happen. So the whole point of, to me, of telling all of these stories is to use almost every, everything we possibly can. It's sort of by any means necessary. And some people respond to funny, some people respond to fearful, some people respond to like, here's a, a huge amount of solutions, like you had all the solutions. But the only thing we, 
know is that we have to try because, and we have to work on human brains in every way we possibly can. And I think fun is the, probably the best vector. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point that there's some people respond to funny and some people respond to fear. But I think the point is that you have to speak the language of your audience. And if you're trying to, to speak to young people, maybe speak like young people. We have time for one more question. There's someone in the back on that side. Yes, you. Me? Yes, you. Shout it out. Do you think you can handle that, Justin? <laughs> it's like, how do you have the spirit of entrepreneurship, even though we're not making bank? The biggest problem with this young generation is they expect everything to be free, too. So that's a whole different problem. So maybe you need to apply it for us, to us for a grant, because I don't know how you get money from it. <laughs> I, I, I'm not 100% sure of what the question was, to be <laughs> honest. But, um, but I, you know, social uh, impact entrepreneurs and and that and doing something that's meaningful, I think, is just something that um, that younger generation is really really focused on. And I, I had some experience uh, working with groups that went down to Haiti and delivered solar light bulbs and had a buy one give one campaign. And I was amazed. I was you know at the table. Selling it was a project that I come up with a, th a thousand light bulbs to women who were in the tent cities, and and it happened and people they bought those things. I, so I, you know, you hear on Shark Tank, here comes a millennial. What are they going to do? There's going to be a cause attached to their product. Hmm. I mean, I think that's really cool. And you know, I don't know uh, about financing the really, 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 really big projects like how are you going to make the planet self-regulating and monitor all these things? Well, big federal organizations like NOAA are doing those sort of things. Uh, NASA, um, um, so we have to. I guess we have to focus on what is going to be fun for us. And, and if having a business, selling a product, and then attaching some kind of um, uh, uh, cause to it, I, I hope that continues to grow because folks are thinking outside of the country and thinking about the whole planet. If you bring people out of poverty, then next thing you know, they have enough money to be thinking about conservation. So that that is one way forward to use capitalism and money uh, for good. Well, speaking of achieving big things, you have all achieved big things. You stayed awake after lunch. <laughs> so thank you all so much. Give yourself a round of applause and thank you to our speakers. <laughs> <laughs>